But in the studio with us now, we are talking to Mike Retter, who's the director of the nominated best feature film, Stanley's Mouth. Good morning, Mike. Good morning. Now, Stanley's Mouth is an interesting film for many reasons. But before we get into the way it was shot, can you just give us a little bit of a rundown of what people can expect when they see it? Like, what's what? tell us the story. What's Stanley's Mouth all about? Uh, Stanley's Mouth is a, a very claustrophobically filmed uh, character study unscripted film, uh, an experiment to break a cycle where I wasn't actually making any films. So it was uh, something to uh, get me started as a filmmaker and try and develop some kind of sensibility. Mm -hmm. Now, the the story of um, Stanley's mouth, it's kind of a curious one. So it's I've, I've got the synopsis in front of me. <laughs> Because I won't read it verbatim, but um, it's about a, a guy called Stanley. He's a he's a Christian boy entering the gay scene. Yeah. Where did like where did this story come from? Like, yeah. Uh, a friend of mine, um, Chris Luskri, uh we had a thing years ago called Rocco Kino, and it, and it was named after his father. Uh, we jokingly made a film every month. Uh, and we would match them up together and see what we came up with in some kind of restriction. And I jokingly said. Uh, maybe the third or fourth film should actually be feature length. And I just thought on the phone at the time an efficient concept where I could uh, uh, have someone that was in the gay scene and a Christian because I thought that the nightclub experience was very similar to the evangelical Christian experience. <laughs> I didn't make that um, at the time and then I dug that idea uh, years later when I just suddenly wanted to make a film, um, except... Uh, we did some church shopping, and I found that the evangelical churches, it would be hard to do them without sort of parody, or mm -hmm. or, or maybe I just didn't have any connection to it. I, I was brought up in the Church of England, really vanilla, and um, that's kind of what I wanted. Uh, the film became more moderate because um, I was interested in moderate Christianity because it's not very loud. So I th just thought it was an interesting subject matter to essentially make a Christian film that was gay, uh, but not not particularly political. So how did you go about? Um, I'm assuming, like you know, did you try and get some churches on side of of this? How do you broach that? It would have been quite sensitive, I imagine. No, uh, not at all. Um, uh, I I was in contact with a um, uh, Church of England deacon. And I was in contact with the Uniting Church uh, minister, and they both um, supported supported the film, uh, gave their time, acted in the film, uh, improvised, uh, came with their own sermons. Also, a Christian musician. Um, no, I, I didn't encounter any roadblocks at all, um, which is well, really surprising. Yeah, that's really cool. I mean, I guess I maybe I'm prejudiced. I would have thought, you know, you'd walk in, that would be quite a difficult thing to bring up. But I, perhaps they're looking to connect to the young you know, a younger generation trying to be more open-minded. I think it's that the, let's call it the silent majority of uh, moderate Christians are just not very loud, and so we don't know that exist, but, you know, people serving you at the checkout or owning a business or walking past the street could be a Christian, but because they they don't have a placard saying, you know, burn faggots or, or something horrible, um, you know. It, it, there's a lot of loud fundamentalism, um, but... I'm kind of interested in that moderate centre that's not very loud. Mm. I, I find it kind of um, much more poetic and vague um, as religion should be. You know, I think you're right. It probably is a silent majority. And because it is silent and probably not that bombastic and exciting to watch sometimes, mm. it often doesn't get represented in to, film. Yeah, and also not to be represented in the media because the media, the media likes loud noises. <laughs> Yeah, the, the media likes conflict yeah. and simple narratives, not, they don't not want... slow, pondering, <laughs> musing, uh, introspective things like that. So, uh, And those old churches are really dying out. They're, they're not exploding like those. Um, uh, I mean, the, the modern mega church, you know, looks like a gym or it's marketed like a housing estate with happily families and childcare and espresso. Um uh, it's, it's very American. I guess I'm interested in sort of traditional European forms of Christianity. Um, mm -hmm. I just find it interesting. I, I mean, I'm an agnostic really myself, but um, but I have a fondness for my upbringing. Yeah, for sure. Well, can you talk, talk us through casting, casting this? Um, the main actor, Stanley Browning, 
Um, and also, you mentioned uh, in in the in the press for this that this is sort of a mix between documentary and fiction. The actor's called Stanley Browning. The character is called Stanley. Um, how did you find your lead actors? Uh, everybody came to us uh, once we just put a call out online. Um, I think that because so few films get made in Adelaide and yet you have these schools churning out actors like a conveyor belt, like one after the other, like dozens and if not hundreds every year. Once you put a project out there and if it's vaguely interesting, um, there's many people to put their hands up. Mm. So I, I would uh, suggest to any filmmakers, come up with an idea and actors will, um, yeah, they will, they will present themselves. Uh, Stanley... It's previously from a Channel 10 TV show called Sam Fox Extreme Adventures. And um, I think... A bit think, of a change. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 quite, I quite liked working with someone who had come from that TV background and putting them in a, um, a very non-scripted and, you know, we gave him a lot of freedom and he ran with it. Uh, and I'm just so... I'm very proud of him. Uh, I think he's a, a great actor um, and it was just a joy to work with him. And I didn't pay him, and he never complained about anything. <laughs> Good man. We're talking to the director of Stanley's Mouth, Mike Retter. Now, one of the things that really stand out about this film, and it's pretty impossible not to notice when you're watching it, that it is shot in 9.16. And if you know what 16.9 is, it's the opposite of that, literally. You turn mm. a screen on the other side. It's in portrait mode, essentially. Um, now, I know you've got a bit of a background in this form, but why did you want to use that form for this film, do you think? Uh, it wasn't a huge aesthetic choice. It was on a whim. Uh, I spontaneously wanted to make a film. I had been working that aspect ratio because we were commissioning vertical films for the first 916, and I just thought um, that would be an interesting challenge, and we discovered what worked and what didn't mostly in post we didn't really have a lot of objectivity while we were shooting it so it is very oppressively close up um and so it, it wasn't a huge um huge uh, decision um it did because i'd i've been working in that aspect ratio for a while because i've been shooting some shorts and promos for 916 the 916 film festival yeah, yeah. It, it was on a whim uh because um a member of the video shop we had at the time, Alison Sean, uh, had made her first short film for the first 916. And uh, we both bonded over a film called Unlack by um, Philip Gronria um, because we both kind of watched it independently from one another twice in a week. And this is a DVD we had that was actually illegal. It was a Russian DVD with no English subtitles. It's a French film. and um, But it's so visually powerful that um, it really required multiple viewings uh, despite having no subs. And I think that even though she had almost no film experience apart from her um, sort of little documentary that she'd made for the first 916, she had such a great attitude um, and a kind of youthful um, energy to just take on a challenge. And I needed someone to add some kind of structure to... Um, the project because I, I I'm very bad at organisation, but she the came from a then steps in. <laughs> yeah, she, she, I mean she comes from a visual arts background, um, and I think that's actually the great hope for filmmaking in Australia is to um, be able to transition from visual arts um, to filmmaking, and they do that with uh, sort of video art. Um, but I think that's our great hope. I think I think there are some institutional problems in Australia um, where our films are um, they all look the same. And I don't think they, they um, explore visual language mm. as much as they could. I think they're quite conservative. And so you will actually, I think, the great hope is um, people from a visual arts background. Yeah, sure. Now, this film, I guess when watching it, we uh, think of the idea that this might be on a phone because I, I would say most people uh, recognise that kind of format, that portrait mode, that 916 thing as being a phone look, right? Mm. Did you? How did you shoot this? Was it on? Was it on phone? No, no, no. We just um, turned the camcorder onto its side. Of course. Um. <laughs> <laughs> There's no tricks or whistles there. No. You just turn it on its side. No. And... and um... Yeah, that's, that, that's it. <laughs> so were you thinking, like, if this does um, go outside, say, the 916 Film Festival, and, I mean, it is going to be, actually, it will be screening as a part of the SASA screenings at the Mercury, that 
primarily perhaps most people will be watching this on a mobile device, therefore you're really thinking about that intimate relationship that people have with their phones? Like, was that in your mind or was it really just, I'm just going to make a film and the only thing really different about it is that it's just going to be... Just coincidence. A different, like a different, in portrait yeah. mode, yeah. Uh, when I was sort of studying film, just, I, I've never studied film, but, you know, reading about filmmakers um, and before the iPhone, a lot of filmmakers talked about making vertical films but never did. I remember reading about David Lynch... How uh, he was thinking of doing it, and I just think um, I think the phone uh, and proliferation of all that vertical content from phones certainly reminded me of the aspect ratio. I just thought it should be tackled a bit more um, professionally. Mm. Um, I think it is a, a legitimate aspect ratio, just like in photography. Not every photo is landscape, and if a film is predominantly people, you know what better way to capture a person than the portrait ratio? For sure, it makes a lot of sense, really. Now, so we, I know you're also involved in something called the Port Film Co-op. Can you just briefly explain what that is? I noticed that the image that they use is from Bad Boy <laughs> Bubby. Um, so obviously Bad Boy Bubby was filmed in Port Adelaide, so it all makes sense. <laughs> well, to hear. Mm -hmm. Bad Boy Bubby was the logo for our video shop, Film Buff Central. We just became so busy doing film projects that we've kind of transitioned from being a video shop to more of a collective of filmmakers and uh, technicians and writers and, and actors. And um, it's a very loose thing for which we sort of produce films. People want to make films and there's only so much funding to go around uh, and funding is slow and uh, funding requires convention and not everyone wants to do that. So we are just making films mostly outside of the system. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I spoke to um, James Curry, who is who was the sound recordist on Bad Boy Bubby, and he was actually, I remember him telling me that, you know, there's a, there's a video store down in Port Adelaide that still has a poster of Bad Boy Bubby. Like, he was just so chuffed. And, <laughs> and I'm like, I can't believe the film keeps kicking on, and that must be you guys. Cold. Yeah, yeah. We, um, film. we never asked permission to use that logo. Like, we actually had the professionally sign it in our window. And it was so good to meet Rolf and James and for them to be totally cool with it and for us to continue using the logo. I'm passionate about Bad Boy Bubby because it's um, such a interesting experimental film and I think it's the greatest piece of art to come out of Port Adelaide. And so there was no sort of tribute to that yeah. film there, yeah. despite, you know, it's uh, awards in Europe and great success. So I, I love championing that film. It's a great film. It's inspiring and it's so experimental and odd it's got 30 directors of photography it uses a uh, binaural uh, sound recording technique um, it's uh, inspiring you know you're so right like that is um, a really it's such like an, let's call it art house experimental film and it probably should be celebrated a lot more than it is in Australia um, and it's you know putting it there as I guess the symbol of your co-op makes a lot of sense and we've spoken a lot about um, you know, making low-budget indie films um, and what that means. And I think indie means something a little, maybe a little bit different in Australia than it does, say, like in America. And, yeah, I and think... indie, indie film in America is still like $10 million. <laughs> but also, like, I think people wear that with a badge of pride in the US, don't you think? Like, oh, I mean, yeah. I, and like, it's not like you're crazy. You went out and shot a, a feature film. Like, who are you? It's something that you have to do because the states don't necessarily have a government funding system like we do because they don't need to because it's much more commercial. They've got more mm. people there, blah, blah, blah. Whereas in Australia, I feel like we're so trained to just, um, you know, you do this, you do make your short film and then you make another short film and then you get some funding for that and then you get your feature and you're allowed to get your feature funded through Screen Australia because you've got these credits already and it's very much a ladder. And I think that that is fine for some people and it works for some people, and that's mm. cool. But it's a very rigid, very narrow pathway. And we've, as you mentioned before, Mike, we've got you know hundreds of people leaving film school, and really that ladder fits one or two, maybe it's three people. It's incredibly <laughs> incestuous. It's incredibly incestuous. It's really hard, hard. to get before in the door. <laughs> exactly. And I think um, we really need to foster a culture of indie feature filmmaking in Australia and not think that they're freaks who are living outside the system and really with the government funding drying up, that's just going to have to be where we exist. I think they need to be spreading the money a lot more. I think we need to be making cheap micro-budget 
uh, feature films for ten thousand dollars, not short films for fifty thousand dollars. I think uh, it's wasted expenditure, uh, and it's not serving the art form. I, I feel that the art form is not put first uh, in this debate, uh, in this the way that things are run. Um, so I think people should take a risk and uh, make things outside the system and call in favors and maybe just carve up ownership of the film like we have. Um, that that is a, a way of getting across the line. Uh, there's no point waiting around, uh, and there's no point making a short film as a um, calling card if it's not in your heart. And mm -hmm. I, I, d I don't believe the system is encouraging of an artistic sensibility. I think that you really need to keep your cool and you really need to play the game. But how does a person do that if their integrity says to do otherwise? So I think it's a, a, a problem. I think that Australian film is generally boring. Uh, most films look the same. They, they look a bit like corporate video. Um, there's... Um, yeah, just not very visually interesting. I, I, I'm not very excited about Australian film. I, I look overseas. There are some great Australian films, I would say. Hail by Emil Corton Wilson, um, Boxing Day by Creef Stenders. Um, th those are films, I think, with a really interesting visual language. Mm. Um, I watched Boxing Day again recently, and that is something that, that is a film that really needs serious retrospective. Um, it's fascinating, but. Yeah. No, I say bring back the days of exploitation. <laughs> yeah, Oz, yeah. Oh, Ozploitation. Yeah, Ozploitation. Where people just making crazy things. Yeah, it's kind of unfortunate because films like um, like Hale, as you mentioned, you know, that doesn't really have a home in a cinema. It doesn't. I mean, it. I mean, it does because it's it's such a visual film. But I mean, it's not going to rack up big bucks at the box office. And I think because of that, we're still trying to work out a way to evaluate success in a film. And it's like, well, people didn't pay any money to go see that film, therefore it's a failure or, you know, it's Oof. going to always exist in this little corner. And even if Hale wasn't a feature film that you liked, I think you have to at least acknowledge that it was it was trying to do things that no one else had seen. Um, you know, I do recommend people just going out and seeing it for just to see something new, Hail by Amiel Cotton Wilson. It's still important to, yeah. I guess, like you were saying, is it's it's still... Because film is a representation of our of mm. our identity, of mm. a way of showing who we are, what yeah. we are. I th the reason why I find film so interesting, I think, is because it's such a mix of business and culture. Because mm. we're talking about film is part of our culture and it's a part of expression. And, you know, I think there's a lot of value in a really artistic film and it can give you so much value as a person watching that, not even just making it, but watching that. But then, of course... The way films are financed now, it's a, it's a business. And then you've got mm. these two sides. But it's a business that's propped up by the government. So mm. it, it, they're, they're trying sure, to be yeah. uh, commercial, making commercial films that generally don't make any money. So I just wonder what the point is sometimes. Mm. I, I don't have any, any, any big answers on it, but I would say that um, we have problems with film culture. I think that there's a real decline in the relevance of criticism. Uh, and um, yeah. uh, I think we need to bring that back it, it's all it's not one particular component that's a problem i think mm. that we have a general cultural um problem and a, a bit defeatist when we say oh you can make a great film possibly a masterpiece like hail but you know does it have a home in the cinema you know is, is there a point to it if it's not commercially viable well, well there is because it's um it's probably the best film in 10 years um how do you quantify that mm. beyond uh, the numerical uh, we're too numerical the I think we need to look at this uh, subject poetically instead of uh, obsessing with, with the numerical and you know, KPIs and, and things like that. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Mike Redder, for coming in and talking with us today. Now, Stanley's Mouth will be screening at the Mercury Cinema. Um, how will that be presented? Like, because it is, uh, they're not going to turn the screen sideways, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, luckily, the, the Mercury uh, has a wonderful 4K projector. I think it's the best cinema in Adelaide. So it will be pillar boxed, but it's on a giant screen. Um, we did show Philip Gonrier's uh, White Epilepsy, which was pillar boxed at the Mercury, and it looked immaculate. So there, there's no problems viewing a, a vertical film in a cinema. Perfect. Well, we will keep everyone up to date as to when that is screening, but it will be the weekend of either the 14th or 15th of May at the Mercury Cinema. If you want more details, you can go to mercurycinema.org.au. And thank you so much, Mike. Thank you.